Welcome, everyone, to another great week of Hearing the Truth Radio. This study is called The Two-Horned Beast and the New World Order, Part 1. And with us today is author D.S. Ferris, as always. Welcome, D.S., to Hearing the Truth. It is good to be here. And, Mike, I must say that we are about to enter into some of the most crucial studies we have done up to this point. We are about to go into studies that are so important for escaping the great deceptions of the last days, for escaping the very system of Antichrist and not being caught in the web of, de of deception and thinking that we're actually in God's kingdom when we're not. So it's very important that we understand what we are about to study today and in following studies. DS, in prior shows, you demonstrated that the Jesuits are the architects of the dispensational futurist ideology, that the Jesuits were personally involved in the Oxford Tractarian movement, which caused the Anglican Church to degenerate back into Catholicism. We also briefly spoke about Powers Court Conference with Nelson Darby and Irving and Edward Irving, and how these men were in agreement with the Jesuit Tractarian movement. Finally, we briefly spoke about C.I. Schofield and how he was one of the more prominent figureheads in bringing the dispensational system to America. And I must say that in all these events, something big was being planned by the Jesuits. Yes, something very big. The work of the Jesuits in promulgating dispensationalism was to subvert the Protestants, not only in Europe, but also in America for a much greater cause, a Catholic New World Order. Is dispensationalism that significant? It is, if it can affect the politics of America into working with Rome for the goal of, of world domination. It's interesting how dispensationalism affects the policies of the U.S. and the Middle East and with Israel. If the Jesuits created the fiction of dispensational futurism and if dispensationalism affects Middle East policy, then it's clear that the Jesuits affect America's Middle East policy and if dispensationalism was developed for a Catholic New World Order, then both dispensationalism and the Middle East become very important components of this issue. That is correct. And in order to thoroughly demonstrate what you just said, we are going to spend some weeks discussing very important issues that build up into the Middle East delusion. In fact, we are going to discuss eight issues, and they are as follows. One, the wounding, submerging, and restoration of papal power. Two, how the two-horned beast represents the United States in Bible prophecy. Three, how the United States is connected to the sea beast politically. Four, the religious aspect of the United States and how the religious aspect of America plays a major role in politics and the great deception of the false prophet. Five, the background of paganism and subversive movements which have laid the foundation for the new world order through the United States. Six, Zionistic elements and the new world order plan. Seven, the mega blueprint for three world wars for the subjugation of the Middle East to the control of the United States and the Vatican. Eight, the negative outcome of the preceding operations and the mark of the beast. DS, do you know how many weeks it'll take to explain all these issues? No, these issues are so huge in scope, it is hard to determine the length of time. But I can guarantee that when we see the large picture of these eight issues and how they coincide, it will become evident that dispensationalism is one of the largest components and the greatest conspiracy of the last days. I will emphasize, it is my purpose to explain each of these topics in detail as we gradually build up a, a panoramic view of the greatest deception the world has ever seen. Through this eightfold analysis, it will be seen and visualized that the dispensational ideology has worked as a catalyst for the great deception. Modern dispensational futurism is not just an incorrect theological system. It is one of the primary ideological sources blinding multitudes of evangelists evangelicals to the great satanic conspiracy for world domination. It's about time this issue be brought out in the open. Yes. Now let us begin. In the show, The Mark of the Beast, we explain that Revelation 13, 1 through 10 describes the papacy as does Daniel chapter 7 and 8. Therefore, if the audience is not familiar with those issues, it is important that at some point in time they go back to those studies, because we are only going to analyze a few points as pertains to the sea beast, and then we're going to move on to the second half of Revelation 13. 
Now, as was analyzed in prior studies, Revelation 13.3 is a general statement of what was to transpire. The beast would receive a wound, and his wound would be healed. Verses 4 through 10 of Revelation 13 describe the career of the beast up to the time that he is wounded, whereas verses 11 through 18 describe the healing of the wound by means of the second beast. Let me say this another way. Verse 3 says, the beast receives wound, his wound is healed. Verses 4 through 10 describe the 42 months or 1260 prophetic day reign of papal power, which took place between 538 through 1798. Verses 11 through 18 describe the healing of the papacy sometime after 1798 by another power, the second beast. Now let us study the wound and healing process. Revelation 13.9 says, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now verse 10, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, verse 10 describes a temporary end to papal power. H. W. Crocker III tells us, The occupying French declared Rome a republic in 1798, and the aged Pope Pius VI was taken prisoner. He died in 1799 in revolutionary France, where the constitutional clerics treated him as an unimportant old man, a heretic from the Enlightenment's new religion of reason, nature, and the state, and that comes from triumph, the power and the glory of the Catholic Church, a 2,000-year history, page uh, 351. In 1798, Napoleon's general Berthier dethroned Pope Pius VI on February 15, 1798, and put papal power to rest. George Trevor tells us in the following. The territorial possessions of the clergy and monks were declared national property, and their former owners cast into prison. The papacy was extinct, not a vestige of its existence remained, and among all the Roman Catholic powers not a finger was stirred in its defense. The eternal city had no longer prince or pontiff, its bishop was a dying captive in foreign lands, and the decree was already announced that no successor would be allowed in his place. And that comes from Rome, from the fall of the West Western Empire, page 440. All right, DS, it's obvious that the papal supremacy existed between 538 to 1798, the 1260 years. And it's apparent that the papacy fell in that year. Now, if you would please explain historically how the wound was carried out on the papacy. Absolutely. General Berthier put forth a bill to restore Italian power back to the people in the form of government based on the French Republic. Alexander Berthier's bill states the following. The Roman people are now again entered into the right of sovereignty, declaring their independence, possessing the government of ancient Rome, constituting a Roman Republic. The general-in-chief of the French army in, in Italy declares in the name of the French Republic that he acknowledges the Roman Republic independent and that the same is under the special protection of the French army. The general-in-chief of the army acknowledges in the name of the French Republic the provisional government which has been proposed by the sovereign people. In consequence, every other temporal authority emanating from the old government of the Pope is suppressed, and it shall no more exercise any function. The Roman Republic, acknowledged by the French Republic, comprehends all the country— that remained under the temporal authority of the Pope after the Treaty of Campo Formio. And this bill here, Alexander Berthier, his bill is cited in Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, page 756. So Napoleon's general put forth a bill that suppressed papal power. Yes, and there is more on this matter. It is important to realize that after 1798, Napoleon set out to codify law into a more unified structure for the French government. The Code of Napoleon is dated between 1801 through 1804. 
Will Durant, in his work, The Age of Napoleon, page 182, tells us that in 1804, the Code of Napoleon became the law of France. Now, why is the Code of Napoleon so important to our study? Durant tells us, finally, after a session that lasted till 2 a.m., the representatives of the Roman Church in the French state signed July 16, 1801, the concordat that was to govern their relations for a century. And that comes from the Age of Napoleon, page 183. I see. The Code of Napoleon caused the papacy to stay under supervision for roughly a century. In other words, papacy lost power for roughly a century. That is factual. Durant further explains the situation where he says, the historic document pledged the French government to recognize and finance Catholicism as the religion of the consuls and the majority of the French people, but it did not make Catholicism the state religion. And it affirmed full freedom of worship for all French, including Protestants and Jews. Napoleon unilaterally added to the Concordat 121 articles to protect the preeminence of the state over the church in France. No papal bull, brief or legate, no decree of a general council or national synod was to enter France without explicit permission from the government. And that comes from the age of Napoleon, page 184. All right, according to what we've seen up to this point, Napoleon gave rise to a secular government in Italy and France. France, and this secularism not only gave freedom to Protestants and Jews, but controlled papal power for roughly a century. Now, explain more about the papal suppression during this time frame, DS. This period of papal decline is known in history as the Roman question. A good definition for this term is defined as a period of time in which papal power, when it has the potential to rise, immediately falls. And this was a process that repeated until the 20th century. Now, it is important to realize that the Code of Napoleon allowed the papacy to resume its religious functions, though under the power of the state. But as the 19th century progressed, the papacy was in a constant flux of losing and gaining privileges. Crocker shows that under Italy's king, Victor Emmanuel II, the Pope's holdings were reduced to a citadel, the immediate environs of Rome, guarded by French troops. And that comes from Triumph, the Power, and the Glory of the Catholic Church, page 360. Now, this situation here was the result of a big conflict of interest between Catholics who wanted to defend the Papal States and the secular government. Crocker continues on page 360. He says, in 1870, the French withdrew to fight the Franco-Prussian War. The Pope's own volunteers were no match for the Italian army, a phrase not often heard in history, which seized Rome for the king and for Italy, whose capital it now became. The Pope, in his own words, became a prisoner of the Vatican. Now, the Jesuit Malachi Martin explains that preceding the 19th century, whenever external or secular powers threaten papal power, the papacy always had countries to defend her. However, in 1870, the papacy was in a different situation. Martin says, there was no more help from any secular quarter, no temporal power to turn to, all the major powers and many lesser powers of pious, meaning pious Pius ninth, Pius the ninth day, have decided the papacy must go, and that comes from the decline and the fall of the Roman Church, page two forty eight. Clearly, this time frame was the deadly wound of papal power. As we studied in prior shows, the papacy had great military power during the 1260 years. But after 1798, the papacy had really nothing, only the Vatican to dwell in. And the secular government told them what they could and could not do. So, D.S., when did this captivity end for the papal power? The papacy did not begin to exercise political power as she did prior to 1798 until the 20th century. 
Crocker says, In Italy, the church achieved its biggest breakthrough. In 1929, after three years of negotiations, the church regained a temporal status with the creation of Vatican City. All 108 acres of it, along with a Lateran Palace, Castile Gandolfo, and a few other buildings. In addition, Italy paid the church a substantial sum in cash and government bonds to compensate it for the loss of the papal states. Equally important was that the church was restored to Italian life. Crucifixes returned to public schools, as did the teachings of the Catholic doctrine. Catholic priests could conduct religious marriages. The war of Italian liberals against the church was over, thanks to the church's newfound ally, Benito Mussolini. And that comes from The Power and the Glory of the Catholic Church, page 387. So it was 1929. That was the beginning of the papal restoration. That is factual. So let me put all this into perspective. The initial wound of papal power took place in 1798 and more completely in 1870. And the period between 1798 to 1929 is the submersion of papal power in its wounded state. Yep. The period between 1929 to the present day is the restoration of papal power. That's true. Diaz, do you realize what this constitutes? Absolutely. These historical landmarks represent the beast that was, is not, and yet is, according to Revelation 17.8. Very true, Mike. Very true. The papacy is the beast. Now that we have discussed the decline, submersion, and restoration of the papacy, we must now discuss the second beast of Revelation 13. Revelation 13, 9 says, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. 10. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, verses 9 and 10 confirm the deadly wound of the sea beast. Now verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. There are two things that we must immediately notice about this beast. One, he came up when the sea beast was going down. Two, this beast came out of dry land, whereas the first beast came out of the sea. We have already explained in prior studies that the sea symbolizes peoples, multitudes, and nations. In the context of this chapter, it appears that the earth is symbolic. Because dry land is the opposite of water, it appears that the two-horned beast rose up in an area of the world that was scarcely populated. DS, this isn't too difficult to figure out. The second beast came up when the sea beast was going down to a wounded state. This means the second beast came up in the time frame of 1798. Moreover, the second beast came out of dry land, a scarcely populated part of the world. When we put both of these issues together, this means in 1798, another beast was rising into power in the new world. Sounds like the United States. They were coming into uh into existence about around that time. Remember 1776 uh, was the uh, year that the Constitution was signed? That sounds, uh, sounds a lot like the United States. That is exactly the case, Mike. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, knew that the papacy is the great Antichrist. In his note on Revelation 1311 and the year 1754, he said, he, meaning the two-horned beast, has not yet come, though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast beast. And that comes from explanatory notes upon the New Testament, volume 3, page 299. Well, I think John Wesley was definitely on to something. Clearly, the second beast is the United States of America. In 1798, America was definitely rising up in the New World. It was in 1776 that the Declaration of Independence was adopted. In 1783, England and Europe acknowledged American independence. In 1789 came organization of the executive, legislative, and judicial departments of the new government. Clearly, America was in its beginning stages when the papacy submerged into its wounded state. Yep, that's true. I noticed that the second beast has two lamb-like horns, but there are no crowns. John 129 tells us that the lamb is symbolic of Christ and horns represent kingdoms as we have seen in Daniel 8.22. Surely the United States is not made up of two kingdoms. You beat me to the punch on that, Mike. Horns also have an application to institutions power. 
Notice Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Obviously, the Lamb is Christ, but Christ is not made up of seven kingdoms. The best interpretation that I have seen for Revelation 5, 6 is that Christ has seven, which of course means completion. Christ has complete power. And the seven eyes represent complete sight. This, of course, points to the fact that Christ, having conquered sin and the devil as the Lamb slain, possesses both omnipotence and omniscience. This issue in and of itself is another study. But the point is, horns can also represent institutional power. What is interesting is that both Revelation 13, 11 and Revelation 5, 6 use both the symbols of horns and the lamb. So in essence, when we look at these correlations, we interpret the two horns on the second beast as two institutional powers that have the appearance of Christianity. Yes, and what might those two institutional powers be? I will let Luther S. Kaufman define this issue. He says, a few centuries ago, men and women oppressed and persecuted by both civil and religious authorities looked across the sea to this virgin land and came here to escape from these persecutions and to, if possible, establish a government in which there might be civil and religious liberty. And that comes from Romanism as a World Power, page 10. The two horns on the second beast of Revelation 13 are indicative of civil and religious power. The term lamb, as applied to these two institutions, indicates civil liberty and religious liberty. These are the two great pillars of the United States. Notice also the following statement from Kaufman, where he says, So it will be seen that even before the formation of our present government, the question of the union of church and state occupied a very prominent position in the minds of the colonists. At the very beginning of this government, the founders thereof saw in the then existing governments of the world the disastrous effects of the union of church and state, because in all the governments of that time, whether they were Roman Catholic or Protestant, if there was such a union, it worked injury to the general welfare of the people. And that comes from Romanism as a world power, pages 15 and 16. It makes complete sense that the two horns represent religious power and political power, and the lamb-like features of the horn symbolize the separation of these two powers. This made the United States distinct from the monarchical system of Europe. That is right. The two-horned beast would not be a monarchical country with a king over it. This is highlighted by the fact that the two-horned beast has no crowns, no diadems. The two-horned beast was to be a country ran by the people, and this country was to have its inception with the appearance of Christian principles. That the United States in its inception had the appearance of Christianity can be seen in the 1787 Constitutional Convention when George Washington was addressed by Benjamin Franklin in the following way. Mr. President, the small progress we have made is, methinks, a melancholy proof of the imperfection of the human understanding. We indeed seem to feel our own one of political wisdom since we have been running all about in search of it. We have gone back to ancient history for models of government and examined the different forms of those republics, which, having been originally formed with the seeds of their own dissolution, now no longer exist. And we have viewed modern states all around Europe, but find none of their constitutions suitable to our circumstances. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth that God governs the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of the Tower of Babel. 
I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly before we proceed to business, and that one or more of the clergy of the city be requested to officiate in that service. And this is Benjamin Franklin speaking to George Washington, and this is cited in Romanism as a World Power, pages 20 and 21. It's clear that the United States came into power with the appearance of Christian principles. Now that we've established that the second beast of Revelation 13 is the United States, we can now discuss the third part of this study. How the United States becomes connected to the papacy politically. Let us begin by reading Revelation 13 verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. 12, And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Verses 11 and 12 reveal that there would be a coalition between the United States and the papacy, so much so that the U.S. would be responsible for causing the world to follow the papacy. But when would this coalition take place? D.S. Revelation 13:12 says that the second beast will cause the world to follow the sea beast when the deadly wound is healed. This, is, this isn't difficult to figure out. The papacy received the wound in 1798, stayed in a wounded state until 1929, and then from 1929 to the present day, the papacy has increased greatly. If the second beast will cause the world to follow the sea beast when the wound is healed, this can only mean that there would be a coalition between the papacy and the United States sometime after 1929. According to Revelation 13, 11, and 12, the two-horned beast would have an alliance with the sea beast sometime during its restoration process. In other words, the United States would develop a coalition with the papacy sometime after 1929. Notice that in Revelation 13:12. The two-horned beast is the power that finishes what was started in 1929. This prophecy shows that America would be the power to completely restore the papacy. This means that there must be a coalition between the papacy and the United States. Notice what Thomas Patrick Melody reveals. He says, the opportunities for the United States and the Holy See to cooperate in the promotion of human rights, religious freedom, and political pluralism are benefiting from the full diplomatic relations now existing between the two powers. This cordial and cooperative framework did not always exist. In fact, it took 208 years for the United States to enter into full diplomatic relations with the oldest international personality and the community of nations. And this comes from the ambassador story, the United States and the Vatican and world affairs. DS, I can guarantee that the reason it took 208 years for the United States to enter this kind of relation with Rome is because for a long time, Protestant Americans knew papal Rome was dangerous. But this is not the case anymore because of dispensational futurism. Oh, yeah. It's important to realize that there have been different attempts through different presidents to establish a solid diplomatic relationship between Rome and the United States, such, such as Roosevelt and Truman, but these attempts had no success. Full diplomatic relations did not come into being until Ronald Reagan became president. Melody says, on January 10th, 1984, President Ronald Reagan announced the establishment of formal diplomatic relations with the Holy See. The 1984 announcement by President Reagan, however, gave full recognition to the unique international so sovereign role of the Pope and his government, not only in Vatican City State, but throughout the world where the Pope and his government exercise their spiritual and political authority. There was no equivocation in this announcement. The United States was extending full recognition for the first time to the government of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. And this comes from the Ambassador story, the United States and the Vatican and World Affairs, page 50. And the last quote came from page 41. Well, not the smartest thing that Dole Ronnie did as Prez, but, uh, you know, he was deceived by Satan also, just as everybody is and will be. Remember that the devil looks and acts a lot like God, so it's it's very easy for leaders of of countries even to, to buy into that type of thing and then, of course, act on it. Adias, uh, how much of an impact did Reagan make on the U.S. by opening up full diplomatic relations? Well, Michael Day Semlin tells us the following. 
Over 50% of the recruits to the United States military academies are now Roman Catholic, according to 1988 figures released by the Catholic chaplain recruitment vicar for the military services. The number of Catholics in the United States House of Representatives increased from 82 in 1950 to 142 in 1986. Catholics occupy key positions in the executive branch, the judiciary, the State Department, the delegation at the United Nations, in the CIA, FBI, and the Department of Immigration. And this comes from All Roads Lead to Rome, the Ecumenical Movement, page 116. I would say that the work of Reagan had a tremendous impact on the United States. In fact, the growing influence of Catholic power in the United States government continued after President Reagan. After explaining Reagan's close relation to the Vatican and its influence on American policy, John M. Swamley tells us that his successor, Reagan's successor, George H. W. Bush, was also responsive to the hierarchy. Swamley, quoting the National Catholic Reporter, says, concerning Bush, he has been more sensitive and more accessible to the needs of the Catholic Church than any president I know of in American history. And that comes from Catholic Power versus American Freedom, page 204. It's evident that the United States has become connected to the Vatican politically. But how dangerous is this union between the papacy and the United States? The Vatican is very serious in its aims to maintain a coalition with the United States because the papacy plans on ruling not only America, but the whole world through the United States. Any Protestant with a competent knowledge of history should question Rome's relationship with the United States. John W. Robbins, in his book Ecclesiastical Megalomania, explicitly defines the purpose of the papacy. He says... The Roman church state is a hybrid, a monster of ecclesiastical and political power. Its political thought is totalitarianism, and whenever it has the opportunity to apply its principles, the result has been bloody repression. If during the last 30 years it has softened its assertions of full, supreme, and irresponsible power, and has murdered fewer people than before, such changes in behavior are not due to a change in its ideas, but to a change change in its circumstances. The Roman church state in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. If and when it regains its full power and authority, it will impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. And that comes from ecclesiastical megalomania, the economic and political thought of the Roman Catholic Church, page 195. John Robin said that right. The Roman church state State in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. If and when it regains its full power and authority, it'll impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. DS, the purpose of the Vatican and American alliance, is world domination. Exactly. Robbins acutely emphasizes, what the Roman church state accomplished on a small scale during the Middle Ages is what it desires to achieve on a global scale in the coming millennium. If it fails to reach its goal within the next hundred years, it will not quit. It will continue to work relentlessly for world power, even if it should take another millennia or two. And that comes from Ecclesiastical Megalomania, page 187. Robbins on page 195 of Ecclesiastical Megalomania emphasizes that the political thought of Catholicism is totalitarianism. Interestingly, Malachi Martin says the same thing about the Jesuit order. Martin tells us, Nevertheless, the brute fact is that many Jesuits wish to see a radical change in the democratic capitalism of the West in favor of a socialism that seems inevitably to come up smelling just like totalitarian communism. And the fact is, as well, that there is no lack of individual and influential Jesuits who regularly speak up for the new crusade. And then he continues, because the new kind of society cannot be democratic capitalism as we know it, the United States as the leader and most successful exponent of democratic capitalism comes center stage. Indeed, as early in the war as the 1960s, when Jesuits in the United States established a Jesuit national leadership project, their working paper was explicit about their intention to change the fundamental structure of America from that of a capitalist democracy 
hypocrisy. And that comes from the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus and the Betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church, pages 16 and 17. The mission of the papacy is to make the United States into a Catholic communist system. In fact, the papacy desires to accomplish this throughout the whole world. Martin tells us, the new mission of the society, for it is nothing less than that, suddenly places them in actual and, in some instances, willing alliance with Marxists and their class struggle. The aim of both is to establish a socio-political system affecting the economies of nations by a thoroughgoing redistribution of Earth's resources and goods and in the process to alter the present governmental systems in vogue among the nations. And that comes from the Jesuits, page 15. I can guarantee that Catholic Marxism will, will not be for the benefit of the poor. Catholic Socialism will be implemented to control the masses while all the wealth sits up at the Vatican. D.S., I think the present danger of Romanism is plain. The papacy is a totalitarian religious system that desires to enforce a religious communism on the world in the United States. Yes, and I guarantee that the papacy has been working through the subversive enterprise of the Jesuit order long before the political alliance was set up by President Reagan. The alliance that Reagan brought into being has only accelerated the speed at which the United States will make an image to the papacy. Prophetically speaking, we are living in the time frame of the beast that yet is, and the United States most definitely has a political coalition with the papacy. This coalition is what allows the papacy to heal from its wounded state. This is precisely what the prophecy of Revelation 13:12 foretold, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Yep, I think now we're ready to analyze the fourth part of this study, how the religious aspect of the United States is supporting the healing of the papal power. I agree. According to the prophecy of Revelation 13, 11 through 15, supernatural elements would cause the people of the United States to follow the papacy. This leads us to the religious aspect of the two-horned beast. Verses 13 and 14 tell us, and he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Notice these texts illustrate that the sea beast had the wound by the sword and did live. The beast that was, was the papal supremacy between 538 through 17. The beast that is not was the papacy from 1798 through 1929. The beast that yet is is the papacy from 1929 all the way to the present day. According to verses 13 and 14, sometime after 1929, the two-horned beast would restore the sea beast. The political aspect of America has already been doing this very thing. Now, in addition to the political alliance with the papacy, there is also also a growing religious alliance with the papacy. Notice that Revelation 13 verses 13 and 14 describe fire being brought down from heaven. The fire that produces the miracles and the two-horned beast represents the religious element of the United States. This is Protestantism. In other words, Protestant America, like the government, will have an alliance with the papacy. Said another way, both religion and, polit and politics will become united with Romanism. I think that's pretty much going on right now. Yes, and let's prove this through the works of the Christian right. The Christian right first emerged under the leadership of Jerry Falwell, a fundamentalist who sought to combat the secularization of society. The Christian right gained support from denominations such as Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, or fundamentalist evangelicals in general. Justin Watson shows that the Christian right has gone through three periods of development. Concerning the first period, Watson tells us, the first or expansionist period lasted from the inception of Christian right organizations in 1978 until 1984. During this period of rapid growth and high public visibility, figures such as Falwell of Moral Majority and God's Angry Man James Robinson of Religious Roundtable influenced the public agenda by bringing moral and family issues 
issues to the forefront of public discussion. Despite its influence, the Christian right failed to get much of its legislative agenda enacted and did not seem to secure much more than rhetorical support from the Reagan administration. And this comes from the Christian Coalition, page 26. Yes, I know about these people. They believe that homosexuality, abortion, and an overall trend towards immorality is destroying America. They want to bring America back to God. That's right, and one of the main purposes of the Christian right from its beginnings was to develop a conservative political majority of Christians who could apply partisan politics for the sake of preserving Christianity as a foundation of the United States. As was just stated, Watson characterizes the growth of the Christian right into three periods. The first period is said to have existed between 1978 through 1984, the second between 1985 through 1986, and the third, 19. 87 and onwards. Watson tells us that between 1985 through 1986, the Christian right did not have much visibility. But after 1987, they began, they began to make great strides towards the political arena. One of the things that really boosted the strength of the Christian right was the work of Pat Robertson. Robertson is well known as the founder of the Christian Broadcast Network, CBN, with his popular 700 Club program used to propagate his political and religious ideologies abroad. In 1989, Robinson founded the Christian Coalition. Watson tells us, the discussion of the purpose, structure, and activities of the Christian Coalition has demonstrated that the Christian Coalition has been an attempt to institutionalize the Christian right. And that comes from the Christian Coalition, page 80. So according to Watson, Pat Robertson attempted to institutionalize the Christian right by creating the Christian Coalition. This tells me that if we want to know the agendas of the Christian right, we ought to study the works of the Christian coalition. That's true, and I will demonstrate why that is the case. Watson says, when the Christian right emerged as a political force, it was quickly accused of wanting to use government to impose intellectual, moral, and religious uniformity on the American people. And that comes from the Christian coalition, page 21. Well, why would people come to this conclusion about the Christian right? People have come to this conclusion largely because of things said by the leaders of this movement. For example, and 1979, Pat Robertson told U.S. News and World Report that counting both Catholics and Protestants, we have enough votes to run the country, he said. And when the people say we have had enough, we are going to take over. Going to take over? What does that mean? And that's cited in the Christian Coalition, page 34. In 1991, Robertson said, the Christian Coalition will be the most powerful political organization in America. That's cited in the Christian Coalition, page 77. Ralph Reed, who was the executive director of the Christian Coalition under Robertson, has been charged with saying, we think the Lord is going to give us this nation back one precinct at a time, one neighborhood at a time, and one state at a time. And I honestly believe that in my lifetime, we will see a country once again governed by Christians. And that's cited in the Christian Coalition, page 77. The problem is that the Christian right aren't even Christians. They're Catholics and Protestants who try to force people uh, into worshiping Catholic traditions. They're not Christian. I completely understand why people would be worried about the Christian right. What amazes me is the fact that Revelation 13 is being fulfilled right before our eyes. The Christian coalition is leading to a religious theocracy. I must also make mention that Justin Watson in different parts of his book shows that the leaders of the Christian right have denied that they want to create a theocracy in the United States. Watson shows several statements from Robertson and Reed in which their focus is on restorationism without religious totalitarianism. Allegedly, these men want to return America back to what they believe to be a time when America America functioned on Judeo-Christian principles. Watson says, what Robertson and Reed want is a return to a supposed golden era in which it would not occur to anyone to question the propriety of public school prayer, the Ten Commandments on the wall of a government building, unbashed mixtures of evangelical piety and patriotism, or the assertion that this is a Christian nation, and that comes from the Christian Coalition, page 121. How in the world can the leaders of the Christian right believe in restorationism without religious control? Is restoration possible without enforcing religion on society? I don't think so. I seriously doubt it. Oh, I know. Believe me, I know. That's an oxymoron philosophy. 
What the Christian coalition is proposing is deception emanating from the Vatican, and I will tell you why. There is another Protestant counterpart to the Christian coalition called Christian Reconstructionism. Watson says, the people of God, according to the Reconstructionists, should exercise dominion using biblical law as the blueprint for a totally reconstructed and holy social order. Reconstructionists propose a society that would be not merely reformed, but rather raised and rebuilt. And that comes from the Christian Coalition, page 110. We must ask, are the leaders of the Christian coalition double talkers? Are they individuals who say on one scale that they want to take over just as the Reconstructionists do, and then on the other scale say that they don't want to create a religious theocracy? Are they double talkers? We're going to find out as we move along. Watson brings to view that there have been many reports and many allegations of Robertson having connections with the Reconstructionists, such as Robertson's Regent University hiring professors with Reconstructionist ties and views, Robertson's book, The Secret Kingdom, having a chapter, The Law of Dominion, being in accordance with Reconstructionism, and Robertson saying and doing things in politics that resemble Reconstructionism. Watson demonstrates on different accounts that Pat Robertson denies having the same agenda as the Reconstructionists. However, when one reads Watson's book, one can easily gain the impression that the leaders of the Christian coalition are either double talkers or confused in their purposes. Well, whatever their true motives are, it's clear that they're fulfilling the prophecy of Revelation 13. That is factual, and we are now going to go deeper into this matter. We are going to discuss religious ecumenism and political ecumenism. Let's begin with religious ecumenism. And a general definition, what is ecumenism? Michael Semlin tells us, the aim of the ecumenical movement is to achieve one world communion, to bring all churches, denominations, and ultimately all religions together. And that comes from All Roads Lead to Rome, the ecumenical movement, page 20. Let us ask, where did the modern ecumenical movement originate? The modern ecumenical movement has its inception with the Catholic Church at the Second Vatican Council between 1962 through 1965. John Swamley explains the purpose of Catholic ecumenism. He says, the Vatican view of ecumenism is that all Christians should be unified in one Christian body. During the Second Vatican Council, the Pope announced that such unity cannot be attained except by identity of faith, by participation in the same sacraments, and in the organic harmony of a single ecclesiastical control. He also asserted that only the Catholic Church can offer these elements. And this comes from Catholic Power versus American Freedom, page 160. Well, in other words, DS, the whole religious ecumenical movement from its inception was the goal of the papacy to ultimately win in all Christian denominations back to the fold of the Mother Church. That is exactly the case. In the 1990s, two ECT documents were created, one of them being a 25-page document developed by 40 well-known evangelical and Catholic leaders. This document is called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. On March 30th, 1994, USA Today reported the document in the following way. And what is being called a historic declaration though not an official stance of either denomination, evangelicals, including Pat Robertson, joined with conservative Roman Catholic leaders Tuesday in upholding the ties of faith that bind the nation's largest and most politically active groups. The leaders in a statement are urging the nation's 52 million Catholics and 13 million evangelicals to no longer hold each other at theological arm's length and stop aggressive proselytization of each other's flocks. In short, to turn their theological swords into a recognition of a common faith. A few moments ago, we spoke about the possible motives of the leaders of the Christian right. Why is it that Pat Robertson is so willing to work with the leaders of the Catholic Church? I think the motives are plain. They're all working toward an ecumenical super church that governs Washington. Oh, I know. DS is becoming plainer and plainer that the second beast of Revelation 13 is the United States, and both religion and politics in America are moving in the direction of uniting with Rome. It is apparent that evangelicals and Catholics are moving towards some form of union. 
In the book, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, Charles Colson tells us, the document, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, was drafted by believing Catholics and believing Protestants, people at the center of their communions, who realize that they have more in common with one another than with borderline liberals of their own traditions. Christians do not have the luxury of limiting their energies to theological debate. True believers must true believers must reach across theological divides and embrace one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our obligation is nothing less than to join together in a defense of the truth of our shared faith. All Christians who confess that Jesus is Lord must unite for the sake of our Lord and for the sake of our culture. And this comes from Evangelicals and Catholics Together, pages 36 and 38. Mark A. Knoll emphasizes the fact that evangelical Protestants and Catholics are uniting regardless of theological differences. He says, once upon a time, in fact, within the memory of many people who are still very much alive, Catholics and evangelical Protestants regarded each other with the gravest possible suspicion. While Roman Catholics and Protestant evangelicals are still divided by many important differences, the possibilities that now exist for communication, theological and social cooperation, and mutual encouragement are so much greater than even a generation ago as to constitute a minor revolution. And that comes from Evangelicals and Catholics Together, page 83. In the Christian American, May, June, 1994, Pat Robertson said, The moral crisis facing society today and the obvious social breakdown mandates a closer cooperation between people of faith. The time has come where we must lay aside minor points of doctrinal differences and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. This statement lays the groundwork for moving forward in a spirit of cooperation. I am lending my support because I believe it's imperative that we work to bring the body of Christ together. Yes, this religious ecumenism is ultimately leading to church and state union. Yeah. G. Edward Reed in his book Sunday's Coming, pages 70 through 72, tells us that in 1995, a Road to Victory conference was held in Washington, D.C., in which the Christian coalition further developed their relations with the Catholic Church, and they planned to work together for the election in 1996. Ralph Reed, who was the executive director of the Christian coalition, spoke at this conference. Ralph Reed said, said the following, I believe that the emerging alliance, the emerging partnership of Catholics and evangelical Protestants is going to be the most powerful force in the electorate in the 1990s and beyond, and anybody that ignores that alliance is going to make a big mistake. We are at a historic time in our nation and in our relationship as Protestants and Catholics. The change we are seeing in America is not just a political change, it is more deeply a spiritual shift that is shifting the plates of the American political political landscape, and Catholics have been at the very center of that. According to exit polls taken after the 1994 election, for the first time in American history, Roman Catholics, a majority of them, 56% of church-attending Catholics and 51% of all Catholics, voted Republican in an off-year election. And I believe that just as the evangelicals have become the base vote of the Republican Party, Catholics are now today the swing vote in American politics. Any candidate who wins the Catholic vote will be able to govern America. No president has been elected since John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960 without winning the Catholic vote. The Catholic vote holds the key to the future of America. I believe if Catholics and evangelicals can unite, there is no person who runs for office in any city or state in America that can't be elected, and there is no bill that can't be passed in either House of Congress or any state legislative chamber anywhere in America. It is the emerging force in the electorate today. The truth, my friends, is this. Catholicism never has been, is not today, and never will be a threat to American democracy. It was and remains the most colorful and the most vibrant thread running through the tapestry of American democracy. In that statement, I see the transparent admission that if Catholics and the evangelicals unite, they can place their policies in both the state and federal government. It is not difficult to see why so many critics have charged the Christian right as seeking religious authoritarianism in the political arena. But these statements are only confirming what Revelation 13 predicted would take place. Reed is sadly mistaken where he says, The truth, my friends, is this. Catholicism never has been, is not today, and never will be a threat to American democracy. He is sadly mistaken.
The Catholic priest, Leo H. LeMann, from the earlier part of the 20th century, explains the problem of ignorance that seems to prevail in America. LeMann said the following, the extent of the influence of the Roman Catholic Church on politics and war is not generally known to the American public. Americans have tried to look upon and treat the Roman Catholic Church in their traditionally tolerant attitude toward all religions, forgetful that its policies have always affected every phase of the life of the nations of the world, and unwilling to believe that a political church would try to gain ascendancy over their government. This has been aided by the purposeful silence of the public press in America, which fear fully eschews all adverse comment on Catholic Church affairs. And this comes from the Vatican policy in the Second World War introduction, page 5. Now, after bringing to light the ignorance of the American populace, LeMann emphasizes the following. Americans have been deceived concerning the aims and activities of the Roman Catholic Church for three main reasons. One, their indifference to church-state relations as a factor in government. Two, their forgetfulness of the disastrous effects of Roman political e ecclesiasticism in past centuries. Three, the purposeful confusion created here in America by Roman Catholic propaganda concerning the real aims of Roman Catholic policy in democratic countries. And this comes from the Vatican policy in the Second World War, introduction, pages 5 and 6. The problem that exists among Americans is well described by Lehman in the preceding quote as indifference, forgetfulness, and confusion. Evangelical leaders who are willing to unite with Rome do not understand the purpose of the papacy in uniting with evangelicals. LeMann emphasizes the unchanging goal of the Catholic Church is the restoration of its status as the only legally recognized church in Christendom. To attain it, liberal democratic constitutions must be continuously opposed and a type of civil government eventually established in all countries that would extend protection only to the Roman Catholic Church. And that comes from the Vatican policy in the Second World War, page 6. Jeremiah J. Crowley, who was a Catholic priest for 21 years, has warned us of the deceit of the Catholic Church. He says, few have any idea of the crafty efforts which Catholic ecclesiastics make to hoodwink non-Catholics. Priests, bishops, and cardinals cultivate a spirit of seeming liberality on purpose to win the esteem of the very people whom they hate, so that these people will be made unwilling to countenance any opposition to the movements of Romanism. And that comes from Romanism, A Menace to the Nation, page 163. Like LeMann and Crowley, the Catholic scholar George La Piena had a far clearer perspective on Rome's ecumenism than Reed and other evangelicals who want to unite with Rome. La Piena said the following, if you search after Christian unity, Rome has said there is only one way of attaining it. Come to Rome and accept Catholic uniformity within the Catholic authoritarian and totalitarian system. Likewise, the totalitarian regime of Moscow answered the appeal for peace and security of the surrounding nations by annexing them to Soviet fold and telling all other nations that peace and security could be established only on Soviet terms. This striking parallelism of claims and policies of a totalitarian state and a totalitarian church is not a casual coincidence. It is the logical consequence of their absolute premises, which, though they differ one from another in content and aims, stand in both systems upon the same firm belief that they and they alone are right, while the others are wrong, and that they and they alone have a universal mission entrusted to them, either by God or by destiny, which must be fulfilled. And that comes from Catholic Power versus American Freedom, pages 20 and 21. These Catholic writers of the past, Leo Lehman, Jeremiah Crowley, and George Piana, seem to have more sense than the Protestant leaders over here. Where Reed says the, Calth the Catholic vote holds the key to the future of America, does he really know the magnitude of what he's saying? Does he not know that the Council of Trent still governs the thinking of the Vatican? 
The reason that the United States will make an image to the papacy is simply because evangelicals have been hoodwinked by the Vatican, and worse, they're part of the conspiracy. The great deception that is taking place right before our eyes is that Catholic and evangelical view is uniting with politics. Yes, we're just about out of time. Can you summarize our study for today? Mike, essentially we have eight issues to cover for the United States and the New World Order study. Today we have covered four issues. Number one, the wounding, submerging, and restoration of papal power. Two, how the two-horned beast represents the United States in Bible prophecy. Three, how the United States is connected to the sea beast politically. Four, the religious aspect of the United States and how the religious aspect of America plays a major role in politics and the great deception of the false prophet. 